Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Mason, and today I'm going to dispel some myths about back pain. You know it's a bad day when you're being carted from your house to a waiting ambulance by firemen. And here he is again, a few moments earlier, a 43-year-old male who developed severe low back pain after CrossFit. At the hospital, he was diagnosed with non-specific low back pain, filled to the eyeballs with drugs and discharged home, still largely incapacitated. And here he is three weeks later, off all drugs, back at work and regularly exercising, including resistance training. So how did he get from the back of an ambulance sucking on a green whistle to regularly exercising with no drugs in only three weeks? Well, it started with an appreciation of what was likely to be causing his pain, followed by some evidence-based interventions. Let's now take a detour looking at the science of spinal pain. Unfortunately, contemporary thinking on low back pain has us throwing in the towel when it comes to diagnosis. Take this 2017 review on low back pain. It explicitly claims that most low back pain has no known pathoanatomical cause. Basically, that we don't know what causes most cases of low back pain. And for the most part, shouldn't bother trying to figure it out. The logical conclusion of this defeatist approach is that patients get lumped with a diagnosis of nonspecific low back pain and oftentimes recipe style treatments. The source of much low back pain, however, both directly and indirectly, is the intervertebral disc. Of course, the prevailing opinion is that discs don't contribute to pain due to the absence of any significant innovation. And to counter that claim, I submit this. Stained in red are nerves. It's now well known that intervertebral discs, even healthy ones, have a nerve supply, at least to the outer surface. Not only that, but many of these nerve endings are C-type fibres known to specifically conduct nociceptive or pain signals. So then, why did the scientific review conclude that there is no known pathoanatomical cause of low back pain? Scientific snobbery. Basically, ignoring any research older than 20 years. For example, of 141 references in this review, only one was from before the turn of the century. This represents a huge volume of lost knowledge. 72 years ago, for example, Swedish orthopaedic surgeon Carl Hirsch provided direct evidence that intervertebral discs could be a source of pain. He inserted a needle into the lower discs of 16 subjects with lower back pain, and in all cases, either the insertion or subsequent movement of the needle reliably reproduced their pain. And after they felt pain from the needle, he injected a small volume of local anaesthetic into the disc. And every single one of these subjects in whom he injected the local anaesthetic experienced complete relief of their pain. Direct evidence that discs can cause pain. And the knowledge that discs can cause pain has been known for more than 90 years. Articles published in 1930 and 1932 in the French literature clearly describe subjects reporting the disappearance of low back pain following the targeted injection of local anaesthetic. And also published in 1949 was a paper by another Swedish surgeon, Gunnar Weiberg, which clearly proved the pain-sensitive nature of the intervertebral disc. He performed back surgery on 200 conscious patients using only local anaesthetic for analgesia. That's right, every one of these 200 patients was awake. And through the careful use of local anaesthetic, he was able to expose the intervertebral discs without anaesthetizing them. He then set about, in his own words, firmly probing the discs to see what they would feel. And in almost all of the 200 patients, he was able to generate low back pain in what was described as a lumbosacral distribution. In other words, irritating the disc caused non-specific low back pain. Subsequently, in 1958, Professor Michael Joseph Smythe from England published a paper with further direct evidence that irritation of the outer part of the disc, the annulus fibrosis, could cause low back ache. After operating on a patient with a nerve root compression, he passed a nylon suture through the outer part of the L45 disc, the annulus fibrosis. He then closed the wound, 
with the free ends of this nylon protruding from the skin. Then, the day after the operation, investigators tugged on the nylon loop, and after about 30 seconds, the subject described the onset of an ordinary backache. In other words, direct stimulation of the L45 disc led to the production of something we would now term non-specific low back pain. And more recently, from 1991, we have this paper. A series of 193 patients were, as with Gunnar Weiberg in the 1949 paper, operated on while conscious. Using local anaesthetic to numb the superficial tissues, the investigators were able to expose the discs without anaesthetizing them. And then, they used both blunt compression and electrical stimulation on the exposed disc to assess the pain response. In two-thirds of the 191 subjects, this stimulation of the annulus fibrosus always reproduced their preoperative back pain. That is, it qualitatively reproduced their pain, identical to their usual low back pain, further evidence that disc irritation can lead to so-called non-specific low back pain. And one consistent though surprising finding common to these experiments is that the pain reproduced by irritation of the discs often had a muscular quality. In other words, the pain mimicked muscle pain. Consider for a moment, how many patients have you seen who have presented describing their low back pain as muscular? Often without any unusual activity that would be expected to cause muscle soreness or injury. Furthermore, pain will often be unilateral after activities such as squatting which use the muscles in a symmetric manner, or with no evidence of muscle tear or contusion. Remember, patients often can't tell the difference between muscle pain and disc pain. And the innovation of spinal discs explains how they can cause a muscular type pain. The sinus vertebral nerve carries the sensation from the disc, and this feeds into the sympathetic chain in fact, the sympathetic chain carries 90% or more of the sensation from the lumbar discs, a fact which has been known since at least the 1940s. And any pain that is transmitted by sympathetic fibres is by definition visceral referred pain, often poorly localised and intense. These nociceptive signals do not follow the usual route of somatic pain, such as might be expected with a muscle or ligament injury. Rather, pain from the disc travels through the sympathetic chain, making it a visceral referred pain. Consider, for example, the pain of a heart attack. Carried along sympathetic nerves, this too is visceral referred pain and is often referred down the arm or into the jaw. And because it's a visceral pain, it's often mistaken for muscular pain. In fact, about 20% of patients experience a heart attack describe their symptoms as relating to muscle pain. Now, as well as being a direct source of pain, disc pathology can also cause pain indirectly by compression of spinal nerves. Here, for example, from a 1959 paper, you can see how an intradiscal injection can increase disc bulging with subsequent impingement upon a spinal nerve root. And you can see two patterns of pain result. As well as the shooting pain going all the way down to the hand, there's a less precise pain around the shoulder blade. And this is important to know. Compression of a nerve root, depending on the severity, can lead to two distinct patterns of pain. We're all aware of the radicular type of pain from a nerve compression, but this is a relatively late presentation, indicating relatively significant nerve compression. But irritation of the outside of a nerve, which can either be chemical or mechanical, without disruption of conductance can lead to a less precisely localised pain mimicking muscle ache. In other words, a progressive nerve root compression, one would expect to see a muscle ache type pain before the onset of classical radicular pain. And to understand why this occurs, consider that nerve roots at the point where they're usually irritated by discs are covered by a pain sensitive layer called dura. Pain sensitive because this dura has a rich nerve supply as you can see here. And as with the nerve supply of the disc, it feeds firstly into the sinus vertebral nerve and then into the sympathetic chain. And remember, pain conducted by sympathetic nerves is visceral referred pain. 
and this occurs before the onset of classical radicular symptoms. It is this anatomical fact which means that the nerve root irritation often presents quite differently to what is commonly presumed. And I believe this leads to misdiagnosis in many patients. In fact, I submit that misunderstanding of the visceral referred pain patterns from irritation of the nerve dura has led to the widespread acceptance of many musculoskeletal syndromes for which there is actually very little evidence. Piriformis syndrome, trochanteric pain syndrome, levator scapular syndrome, quadrilateral space syndrome, ITB friction syndrome, sacroiliac joint pain syndrome, T4 syndrome, the list is long. I first considered the possibility that nerve pathology could present as a poorly localised pain after a patient with long-standing sacroiliac joint pain had a CT guided injection for another problem and his sacral pain disappeared. He was an elite athlete with a long history of sacroiliac pain who had the recent onset of classical radicular symptoms down his leg. And after a CT guided injection targeting the S1 nerve, not only did the pain in his leg improve, but his sacral pain completely disappeared. And for more evidence that irritation of the dural sleeve surrounding nerve roots can cause pain mimicking these syndromes, we return to the 1958 paper by Professor Michael Joseph Smell. A total of 37 subjects underwent open surgery for back pain, during which they also had loops of nylon thread passed around one or more nerve roots. The thread was left to come out of the skin after which the wound was closed. Then after the surgery, the investigators, in their own words, gently pulled on the threads. And what they found was two reproducible patterns of referred pain, what the authors termed neuralgic pain and myalgic pain, as in muscle pain. One of the patients in this study had the thread passed around his right S1 nerve root. And this is the account. 36 hours after the operation, there was complete relief from cytokine pain. The nylon thread was exposed and a gentle pull exerted on it. The effect was immediate. The patient jumped and exclaimed that a severe pain shot into the right buttock. It disappeared at once when the nylon was relaxed. At the second attempt, the thread was very slowly drawn upon until the patient could feel pain. This time, it was not so intense. The thread could be barely touching the root. Then, tension was increased, and as it mounted, severe pain spread from the centre of the right buttock down the centre of the back of the right thigh. It appeared to consist of two components, a sharp pain, which ran as if along down a line to the extremity, and a deep, boring, aching, unpleasant sensation felt diffusely in the soft tissue. And this is clear evidence that nerve root irritation can present both as muscle pain and classical radicular pain. Another patient in this study felt pain in the area shaded in red after tugging on the thread around the left L5 nerve root, a pattern closely resembling what is often diagnosed as piriformis syndrome or sacroiliac joint syndrome. And I often see patients with pain a little further out laterally being treated for greater trochanteric pain syndrome. And in the same patient, this was the pattern of pain from irritation of the left S1 nerve root, which affords some understanding of the condition commonly referred to as back-related hamstring pain. In yet another patient, S1 irritation produced a localised pain liable to be diagnosed as ischial bursitis or proximal hamstring pathology. Now, we know that sitting is associated with increased pressures within the lumbar discs. And this can be a source of nerve root irritation. And that all of the syndromes I've just mentioned are known to be exacerbated by sitting is therefore relevant and consistent with them being caused by irritation of the nerve root dura. These pain patterns are also well known by neurosurgeons who document the progression of symptoms from nerve root compression in their patients. They note that the symptoms usually begin as a perception of muscular aching before they progress to the more classical radicular symptoms. And cranial nerve root irritation too can lead to muscular type pain. In this 2006 paper from Japan, it is noted that patients with cervical nerve root compressions frequently report muscle aching around their scapula. And so in 50 patients who underwent cervical nerve root decompression surgery, 
a pain map was recorded around the shoulder. Changes in pain were then assessed after surgical nerve root decompression. A relatively predictable pattern of pain attributed to different nerve roots was identified and, as with lumbar nerve root irritation, cervical nerve root irritation is often diagnosed as various syndromes. This can include Levada scapular syndrome, T4 syndrome, quadrilateral space syndrome, and numerous other obscure conditions. And as with the lower limb syndromes, these syndromes are frequently considered to be posturally exacerbated, again suggesting nerve root dural involvement. Now one thing I've advert observed is that in many patients suffering low back pain with clear neurological findings on examination is that these findings are often ignored in favour of implausible diagnoses. Take for example the association of low back pain with gluteal weakness. The gluteal muscles receive supply from both the L5 and S1 nerve roots, which is why involvement of these nerves can lead to gluteal weakness. This is why both a Trendelenburg gait and gluteal wasting are considered potential signs of radiculopathy. The trouble is, rather than considering the possibility that the nerve root irritation may be causing both the back pain and the gluteal weakness, many practitioners assert that somehow idiopathic weakness of the gluteal muscles, occurring for no obvious reason, is the ultimate cause of the back pain. And unfortunately, this thinking has been propagated in the literature. In this study, which documented the correlation between gluteal muscle atrophy and low back pain, it was stated that the muscle wasting may represent incidental disuse atrophy. Of course, with nerve recovery will come muscle recovery, which means that many people on gluteal strengthening programs will eventually recover, not necessarily because of the treatment, but rather during it, and in some cases, in spite of it. Nonetheless, this observation that recovery of muscle function and improvement in pain coincide only serves to reinforce the cognitive errors inherent in this type of thinking. And this kind of thought process is nothing new. I had my first exposure to it more than 20 years ago when I was taught that dysfunction of the multifidus muscle was the cause of low back pain. The thinking was that patients with low back pain often had disproportionate atrophy of this muscle, and so it must be the cause. Well, multifidus has what is called a segmental innervation, meaning it drives its nerve supply from local levels. The result of a nerve compression is therefore localised atrophy. Multifidus atrophy is not so much a cause of back pathology, but a result. So if you see a patient who's had their back pain attributed to a muscle weakness or a muscle, muscle atrophy, please reconsider their diagnosis. Now back to the question of making the diagnosis of nerve root involvement. As always, history is key. In particular, trying to discern between the two types of pain, visceral referred or radicular. When asked to show me the pain, if a patient rather than pointing with a finger indicates the location with a wave of their hand, this much more likely indicates to me it's gonna be a visceral pain due to the less defined localization. Also the history of causative or provocative events. If there's no history of a mechanism that could injure a muscle and no evidence of muscle pathology, such as on imaging, don't diagnose a muscle problem. And as well as a neurological exam examination, muscle palpation for trigger points can be very useful. Perhaps surprisingly, the presence of these focal trigger points of muscle tenderness and spasm can be highly specific for the presence of nerve root irritation. For example, one study published in 2016 found that the presence of trigger points in the upper outer gluteal quadrant was more than 90% specific for lumbosacral radiculopathy. 90%! That is, if trigger points are found here, there's a 9 in 10 chance that the patient has a nerve root pathology. And compare this with the straight leg raise test commonly used to diagnose lumbar nerve root pathology, which only has a specificity of 26%. This probably also explains the increasing popularity of trigger point needling. When done effectively, patients often report significant pain relief. The problem is, being a treatment to a symptom and not the root cause, relief is often only temporary. And pain can also arise indirectly from disc pathology. For example, from disc space narrowing. Facet joint degeneration usually occurs only secondary to disc space narrowing. In fact, facet joint arthritis without pre-existing disc disease 
is rare. The reason is that facet joints normally support approximately 20% of the axial load of the spine, but in the case of disc space narrowing, this load can more than double, and obesity makes this worse, with a BMI of over 30 increasing the risk of facet joint OA by five times. Of course, arthritic facet joints by themselves do not necessarily correlate with pain. They can often be seen on imaging, especially MRI scans, quite incidentally. And my preferred investigation for identifying a symptomatic facet joint is a CT spec bone scan, followed by diagnostic CT guided injections. And the resultant osteophytic bone spurring of arthritic facet joints, combined with a disc space narrowing, not uncommonly leads to something called framinal stenosis. And this can compress a spinal nerve root as shown by the bottom arrow. The symptoms again depending on the degree of severity of the nerve compression. And arthritic facet joints can also impinge on the descending nerve roots in the lateral recess of the spinal canal, presenting very similarly to irritation in the foramen, but requiring very different treatment. And finally, bony spurs on facet joints can also impinge on the back of the spinal discs as noted in this 1991 paper, and this can cause pain. Another way disc degeneration can indirectly contribute to pain is via bony injury to the vertebral bodies known as modic changes. The strongest risk factor for modic changes is disc degeneration, and it's common to see a kissing type pattern of bony bruising in adjacent vertebral bodies. Another important factor regarding the pain from modic changes is that that too is carried by the sympathetic nerves, meaning it is vague and it's visceral. And as I already alluded to, there's much debate in the role of imaging in diagnosing spinal type pain, especially MRI. The most significant criticism, one that is often well justified, is that symptoms are often over attributed to non-specific findings, such as disc dehydration. The corollary of this is there are some findings that are both obvious on MRI and well correlated with pain. One of these is an annular tear. Here you can see a focus of hyperintensity on a T2 weighted MRI, indicating an annular tear. Oftentimes they're quite small and frequently underreported. They are, however, usually painful, settling down over about three to six weeks. This then allows for reassure, reassurance of the patient. Often after an annular injury, even after resolution of the pain, there's dehydration of the disc. On a fluid sensitive MRI sequence, these discs will often appear quite dark compared to the adjacent discs. Usually these are not associated with pain. The problem is emotive language like disc desiccation and degeneration is often employed when reporting, contributing to fear avoidance behaviors and catastrophization in patients. And disc bulges are also often over-interpreted by both patients and therapists as being a major problem, rather than the common and often incidental finding which they are. Of course, not all disc bulges are benign, especially when it comes to nerve root compression, which can and does cause symptoms. Unlike disc dehydration and simple bulges, however, when MRIs will often detect asymptomatic pathologies, the sensitivity for an MRI in detecting a nerve root compression is actually quite poor. Let me say that one more time. MRIs are not that good at detecting nerve root compression. Many practitioners take it at face value that if an MRI says there's no evidence of neural compression, then there's no neural compression. But they shouldn't. In fact, this systematic review found that MRIs detect only 25% of clinically evident nerve root compression. Now this is not all that surprising, given we know spinal structures respond dynamically to loading. Many patients with symptoms exacerbated by sitting will report relief in lying. So then we scan people in supine, in lying, spine unloaded. It's predictable that we may miss things which would be detected on a seated MRI scan that would detect dynamic changes. Of course, we now have access to upright MRI scanners. And while these can be useful in some patients, namely those with postural or positional pain, the resolution is less than great. The problem is that the magnets in these scanners are relatively weak, only 0.6 Tesla compared to the preferred three Tesla scanners. And magnet strength is a major determinant of image quality. This then leads to a problem where we may suspect nerve irritation, 
but lack the diagnostic tools to prove it. If radicular signs are present, we can usually guess at the level of an involved nerve, but only to within a level or so. The problem being that most areas of the skin are actually innervated by two or more nerve roots. Further, published dermatome charts have significant variation between them, as is evidenced by this table comparing those from seven anatomical texts. Take for instance the lateral aspect of the foot. While usually considered to be supplied by the S1 nerve root, it's not uncommonly supplied by L5. And this was the case in my patient here, who had complete relief of lateral foot pain following a CT-guided L5 injection. And this serves to illustrate the diagnostic value of CT-guided injections. I personally believe they're underutilized, both diagnostically and at times therapeutically. Injections can also help identify the site of a nerve compression, which is important as this can completely change management. Additionally, other structures such as facet joints can be targeted if there's suspicion they're causing pain. And as well as being diagnostic, they can also provide several months of pain relief. This study finding facet joint injections led to an average of 19 weeks of pain relief. Now there's one more quirk about how nociception is carried from the lumbar spine to the brain that can be used diagnostically and therapeutically. We've already seen that a number of structures of the spine can lead to nociception, which is carried to the brain via sympathetic nerves. This includes the disc, the dura covering the nerve roots, and the vertebra themselves. Well, after travelling along the sinovertebral nerve to the sympathetic chain, these signals ascend to the level of L2, where they pass back with the L2 nerve through the L2-3 intervertebral foramen. This means blockade of the sympathetics at this level has the capacity to block the signals from reaching the brain from the spine below it. And this is well known with sympathectomy sometimes being used for this purpose. This study, for example, looked at the utility of unilateral L2 nerve blocks on the side of maximal pain in 33 subjects with low back pain. Afterwards, all patients reported improvements in their back, buttock, thigh, or groin pain, almost completely disappearing in 26 of them. Also of note is that of the nine patients with sciatica symptoms, only three had partial relief indicating a different pain pathway for radicular pain, as we already know. Furthermore, the average duration of pain relief was more than 20 days, despite the use of only short-term local anaesthetics. And this is not an isolated finding. This randomized double-blinded study found that L2 nerve blocks were still relatively effective even at 30 days. This makes these injections suitable for settling down acute exacerbations of pain. And the prolonged reduction in pain that is often seen with these injections is hypothesized to arise from a reset effect to the sympathetic nerves, which I suspect is central to the etiology of central sensitization. It's important to understand that the center of the disc, the nucleus pulposus, is what is known as immune privilege, basically meaning the absence of immune functioning cells. The problem is, if the immune system does come in contact with the nucleus, as it can when the annulus is breached and the nucleus extrudes, the immune system will perceive the nucleus component of the disc as foreign and attack it. Now this is not necessarily as bad as it first sounds. It's more of a double-edged sword. One problem of the inflammatory response is that it acts as a nociceptive sensitizer leading to hyperalgesia, basically making local tissues, for example nerve roots, much more sensitive. This means mechanical pressure, which normally ought not be painful, is. In fact, Michael Joseph Smythe described this clearly in his paper, where he looped threads around the different nerve roots, stating, the nerve root which has been pressed upon by a disc was much more sensitive than a neighboring nerve root not involved in the herniation. On the flip side, however, this inflammatory immune response leads to progressive resorption of the extruded nucleus, by specialized cells called phagocytes. Here you can see the inward blebbing of a phagocyte in action. We can even measure a biomarker of this inflammatory process on a blood test using a chemical called interleukin-17. You can see subjects with ruptured discs have far higher levels of interleukin-17 than healthy controls. And this process, about two thirds of the time, results in resorption of extruded disc fragment. 
compare the disc prolapse here on an initial MRI with one 17 months later. And this is great news for patients and allows for positive messaging. If they have an extruded nucleus pulposus, it's more likely than not to spontaneously resolve. All it takes is time, often with a couple of steroid injections a few months apart to control their pain. Of course, this means that about one third of disc extrusions don't resolve with conservative management. And we know why. I assist a neurosurgeon, which means I often handle the surgically removed disc fragments. And it's quite common, especially in patients who have failed long periods of conservative management, to find pieces of vertebral end plate in the tissue, cartilage. It's quite obvious, they're firm rubbery pieces compared to the more friable consistency of the nucleus. And these cartilage fragments do not get resolved by phagocytes. They're not immune privileged as the nucleus is and so are basically ignored by the immune system. This 2018 Japanese paper demonstrated as such, they found reduced immunity, specifically reduced phagocytic activity in disc fragments containing a lot of cartilage, explaining what they termed a failure of the expected spontaneous remission. So basically, the natural resolution or resorption of a disc extrusion depends on whether or not it's mainly nucleus pulposus or vertebral end plate cartilage. And while imperfect, we can sometimes get a sense of this on MRI. This paper suggests it's possible to identify cartilage within a disc prolapse, which may allow prediction of which patients are likely to respond best to conservative management. But what about patients who have a disc protrusion, which may be causing pain from either the annulus fibrosis or nerve root irritation, but where the nucleus is contained? Well, in this situation, natural resorption of the disc is not going to occur, at least not through phagocytosis. And this is probably the most common situation in so-called non-specific low back pain. Thankfully, there is an evidence-based approach. This paper from 1999 describes how a volunteer wore this belt with a pressure transducer at the end of a small rod. The pressure transducer was then inserted into the center of the L45 disc and held in place by the belt. Over a 24 hour period, the volunteer then engaged in a variety of different activities, during which the pressure in his L45 disc was continuously recorded. This graph shows the results. You can clearly see that lying down and reclined sitting lead to the lowest disc pressures, while sitting slumped forward, standing flexion and squatting were associated with very high disc pressures. Clearly, in terms of disc pressure, posture matters. Time of day also significantly influences disc pressure. The spinal discs are actually composed of more than 70% water, and about 25% of this can both exit or enter the disc over the course of a day and night. And this fluid shift leads to a change in disc pressure. Basically, discs contain proteoglycan molecules which attract water. Working against this is mechanical loading of a disc, which can force water out. And this load may be as simple as standing up with the axial loading from the weight of the body, leading to a net movement of fluid out of the disc. The corollary of this is that in the recumbent position, with removal of axial loading, the proteoglycan molecules attract fluid leading to a net movement of fluid back into the disc. Indeed, this was shown in our belt wearing volunteer. Over seven hours of sleeping, simply due to the action of proteoglycans drawing fluid inwards, pressure in the disc increased 2.4 times. Putting these facts together, that disc pressures are increased both in the morning and with flexion-based postures, it makes sense that flexion activities should be avoided early in the morning. In fact, it's been shown that the disc stresses are three times greater for the same degree of lumbar flexion when performed in the morning than when performed in the evening. Three times higher. And this study used height as a surrogate marker for disc pressure, demonstrating that the most at-risk time was within the first one and a half to two hours of the morning. And this formed a key part of the treatment of our 43-year-old CrossFitter. In addition to reassurance and education regarding the likely course of his symptoms, he was told, if possible, to pop on a dressing gown for the first hour or so after rising, 
so that he didn't have to bend forwards while getting dressed. He was discouraged from going to the bathroom immediately and advised to eat breakfast standing up. And when he did get dressed, he was shown how to do this lying supine by avoiding spinal flexion and axial loading at the same time. This reduced the peak pressures experienced by his injured discs. And understanding that reclined sitting has lower disc pressures than upright sitting, this was his recommended posture driving to work, also using a lumbar roll. And at work, he was encouraged to use a standing desk. And you can also see he's wearing slip-on shoes, shoes that can easily be put on with a long handle shoehorn. His low back was taped in this manner, providing him with enhanced proprioceptive feedback so he could more reliably avoid flexion. He was also taught different lifting techniques, both for heavier objects like children on the left or lighter objects on the right, more commonly known as the golfer's lift. And this allowed him to maintain his function while also allowing his back to recover. But these strategies weren't taught to him in a vacuum. You might recognize several of these strategies as similar to ideas from well-known back pain treatment protocols. This includes the maintenance of neutral spinal posture, common to both the McKenzie method and the approach popularized by Stuart McGill. His treatment also drew heavily on cognitive aspects to de-threaten his pain and encourage as much pain-free function as possible. And we paid a lot of attention when we were interpreting his MRI that we only focused on the specific findings that actually mattered. But at the end of the day, these strategies are based on science. And I believe the single most important paper informing the treatment of low back pain that has ever been published is this one. It was a randomized controlled trial where the intervention group was simply instructed to avoid flexion for the first two hours of the day. Sounding familiar? And those in the control group were prescribed six exercises. Patient education in the intervention centered around flexion avoidance, including how to log roll out of bed, instructions to avoid all bending, squatting and sitting for the first two hours after getting up. Subjects were given advice on how to carry out their usual activities. And after two hours, they were simply instructed to maintain a straight back, a very simple 45 minute intervention. So what results did they get? Well, compared to the pain reductions in the exercise group, the postural management group had almost six times the benefit at six months. And there was still clear evidence of benefit at 12 months, far in excess of what was achieved with the exercise-based approach. And yes, even after three years, compliant subjects still showed benefit, having 51% less pain days. All this with a single 45-minute educational intervention. Far superior results to any other intervention I've ever studied. I'd like to now touch on something relevant to the concept of controlling spinal flexion in patients with back pain, something called the stress riser effect. During flexion, each involved joint contributes to the movement. And if for some reason a joint is blocked from moving, then adjacent joints will have to compensate by moving more. And this increased movement can increase the risk of injury. We see this, for instance, when the L5 vertebra is fused to the sacrum, preventing normal movement of the lower disc. Given the lower disc, the L5-S1 disc, normally contributes 75% of flexion of the lumbosacral spine, the overload on the L4-5 disc is obvious. A stress riser effect also exists following surgical fusion. And this is one reason some cynically refer to it as the gift that keeps on giving. Once a patient's had a fusion, it's likely that in the future, it'll need to be extended to adjacent levels as they deteriorate, sometimes multiple times. And this makes it critical that if you've got a patient who's had a spinal fusion, they understand the importance of limiting lumbar flexion as this is their best chance of slowing down adjacent level degeneration. And here's a key point. The hip joint is also within this kinematic chain and restriction of hip flexion, such as occurs with FAI, femoroacetabular impingement or hip arthritis, can lead to a stress riser effect in the adjacent lumbosacral spine. There is, however, a simple strategy to reduce it. Given that the acetabular rim is deeper anteriorly than out laterally, performing hip flexion activities in a degree of relative abduction, abduction 
affords for a greater degree of hip flexion, reducing compensatory flexion in the lumbar spine. As an aside, the varying anatomy of different populations means that some people have more shallow hip sockets than others, affording better flexion. Genetically, it thought that on average, Eastern Europeans have more shallow hip sockets, which allows them greater hip flexion. And this might be one reason they're good at weightlifting. Basically, they can go into a deep squat while sparing the spine. And for somebody with deep hip sockets, squatting can be modified, such as by utilizing a wider stance, the sumo squat, or lifting off blocks to make it safer. I'd like to quickly touch on something which is topical at the moment, where I believe the science is at risk of being overinterpreted. We know that exercise is trophic to tissues. What does that mean? Well, when we progressively load a tissue, it adapts to resist the load. Basically, the tissue can get stronger. And discs exhibit this as well. This study, for instance, found that runners have increased disc height and better disc hydration than non-runners, a result of the increased disc loading. And this is also true for other means of loading a disc. Improvements in disc hydration have in fact been found in both cyclists and rowers. Some have suggested that this means cycling and rowing are therefore good for the back and should therefore not be discouraged in those with back pain. This perspective, however, in my opinion, is a misinterpretation of the science. It demonstrates that tissues, including discs, respond to load as would be predicted. It means that the discs of the rowers and cyclists studied became more resilient and better able to withstand the stresses placed on them. It does not mean, though, that those with back problems will benefit from these exercises. Indeed, the evidence would suggest the opposite. The lifetime prevalence of back pain in rowers is up to 94%, hardly something of a population with resilient discs. And a 2010 study on professional cyclists found that 58% had had low back pain in the previous 12 months. And obviously, these rates of low back pain are likely to be contributed to by the fact that these athletes are often training early in the morning when the pressures in their discs are highest. Rather, it makes sense that these exercises should only be encouraged either in someone without back pain or in someone in whom the exercise is not a problem. For example, patients with symptomatic spinal canal stenosis often find flexion-based exercises relieving. If someone has a disc injury, an annular tear, say, it's illogical to stress the tissue acutely. Further, if pain is caused secondary to a disc bulge irritating a nerve, flexion-based exercise will probably be provocative. Rather, I like to reassure my patients that while their back may not go back to exactly the way it was, there's no reason to not aim for a fully functional lifestyle, including intense exercise. And indeed, this is where our 43-year-old CrossFitter ended up. He's now leading a full life with no medications and no pain. And while he does engage in intense exercise regularly, he now does it just a bit differently. Thank you.